The arid landscape of New Mexico was as barren as a man's prospects in the 1880s. It was the Old West, and traditional values still held. Despite the hardship, there was the belief that if you worked hard, you could succeed. It was into these pioneering times that Gus and Mary Hilton decided to begin a family. They celebrated Christmas Day in 1887 with the birth of their first son. They named him Conrad. The Hilton family lived in a small village a stone's throw from the Rio Grande. Conrad's father, Gus Hilton, was a large man who sported a handlebar mustache. His loud and robust voice commanded attention. He owned the town's general store. He also dabbled in any legitimate business that could be profitable. If the business wouldn't come to him, Gus would ride into the mountains to find it, trading for furs and beavers, bartering for blankets and gold nuggets. From his father, Hilton learned the value of hard work and tough negotiation. But from his mother, he learned a very different set of values. Mary Hilton was as quiet as her husband was loud, as pious as he was hardy. A pioneering woman, she was the backbone of the family. Mary instilled in her son a deep devotion of the Catholic faith and a belief in the power of prayer. This mixture of values, his dad's love of work, his mother's deep faith, shaped Conrad in his early years, instilled in him a winning attitude and a drive to succeed. As a boy, Conrad would ride his pony to a one-room school. Hilton excelled at arithmetic and learned to speak Spanish from his many Mexican and Indian friends. As soon as he could see over the counter, Conrad went to work for his father at the general store. And it was here that he learned the basic principle of his father's business. The buyer should get a bargain, the seller a profit. Somewhere in between was the fair price. My father developed quite a knack for negotiating. When he worked for his father uh, in his general store, they had a lot of trappers that would bring skins in and he would uh, negotiate to acquire those skins. And of course, whether you're buying skins or hotels, uh, it's the uh, same type of uh, negotiations that take place between individuals. Working at the general store also gave Conrad a taste of the hotel business. Salesmen who rode the line from Albuquerque to El Paso occasionally made a stopover at Socorro. As soon as Gus heard the train coming, he'd send Connie to greet the arrivals, with orders to corral anyone looking for a clean room and a hot meal for a dollar a night. While Conrad lured many a guest to his dad's makeshift hotel, he wasn't much interested in being a part of the hotel business. No, he had bigger dreams. By 1910, Hilton had grown into a tall, strapping young man of 22. The Hilton family had also grown. Conrad was now one of eight children. As the family grew, so did Gus's business. The little general store had expanded into a thriving dry goods enterprise. Gus was now a wealthy, well-respected merchant known throughout the territory as Colonel Hilton. Gus expected Conrad to continue to work for him, but Conrad and his father often clashed. Gus was demanding and plagued with bouts of melancholy. Conrad struggled to make it work, but in his heart he knew his father would never treat him as an equal partner. To escape his overbearing father, Conrad would have to branch out on his own. The opportunities of an expanding nation presented Conrad with his first chance to break away. In 1911, New Mexico became a state. The new state offered new political opportunities. Over the objections of his father, Conrad entered politics. Hilton served a two-year term in the lower house of New Mexico's first state legislature. He authored eight bills, ranging from a law requiring proper highway markers to a bill prohibiting the depiction of crime in motion pictures. When his term expired, Hilton threw in the towel, saying politics were too slow and frustrating. But one aspect of his political experience would stay with him. The thriving social life of the city captivated Conrad. 
He attended lavish balls thrown at the state capitol. He learned to dance and developed a passion that would stay with him forever. Returning home, Conrad had to face his father's steely eyes and I told you so grin. But Hilton was not about to give up. He was more determined than ever to strike out on his own. His family's love of music gave him a chance to try again. His sister Eva played the violin. She had formed a group with two of her friends. They called themselves the Hilton Trio. Certain the pioneering citizens in the area would flock to any entertainment, Conrad became their manager, agent, and roadie. He set up concerts for the trio throughout the summer of 1916, but very few came to see them perform. They barely broke even. Conrad was discouraged, but resolute and determined. Returning home, he immediately set about making his first serious dream come true. Hilton reasoned since San Antonio had no bank, why not open one himself? Gus tried to talk him out of it, arguing the town was too small to support a bank, especially with banks in nearby Socorro. But Conrad wouldn't listen. He scrounged up a few thousand dollars and opened San Antonio's first bank. Hilton was its president, cashier, and sometime janitor. For over a year, Hilton struggled to convince the citizens of the area to entrust their savings to him. Very few did. Finally, Conrad was forced to admit that his father had been right. The bank was a lousy idea. Conrad Hilton was now 26 years old without a career he could call his own. It seemed his only option was to work in the store under the dictates of his overbearing father. But an event was about to transform America and transport Conrad far away from the security of his father's general store. It was 1918. The world was at war. Far from the titanic conflict of the Great War, a young man in a small New Mexico town was struggling to find his place in the world and escape the overbearing influence of his father. When the United States entered World War I, Conrad Hilton got his wish. He enlisted and was sent to France. Once again, his ambition was stifled. The Army wanted to use his experience in the dry goods business. They assigned him to the supply section. Conrad was kept away from the front lines. It was easy duty. He was posted in Paris and became well known in the bistros off the Champs-Élysées. Although he never mastered the language, Lieutenant Hilton did delight in the women and the culture of France. He found his war experience enlightening. As he would say, before I had been a big frog in a small pond, now I realized I was just a tadpole in an ocean. Hilton loved his time in the service. But the joy at being on his own in the wondrous city of Paris was shattered when he received the telegram a few days after armistice that read, Father dead, come quick, mother. Gus Hilton always tried to be a man of firsts. He had brought the first automobile to San Antonio. Unfortunately, Gus was the first casualty in the town's first automobile accident. Discharged from the service, Conrad rushed home as quickly as he could, but he was too late for the funeral, too late to pay respects to the man he loved, admired, but at times resented. Hilton knew his father would want him to take over the general store, but Hilton sensed the boom years were over for Socorro County. The mines were running out, the trains had cut back their schedules. If he were to find his fortune, Hilton knew it wouldn't be in his hometown. As fate would have it, the newfangled machine that claimed his father's life was also creating a bonanza of riches. Just over the horizon, in the great state of Texas, black gold was making millionaires overnight. With his life savings of $5,000 pinned to the inside of his coat, Hilton came to Texas in the spring of 1919. But it wasn't in the oil fields that Conrad sought to stake his claim. 
The son of pious Mary and conservative Gus was far too practical for wildcatting dreams. While he was open to opportunity, Conrad was adamant about pursuing his life as a banker. An opportunity arose in the oil town of Cisco. A bank was for sale. Determined to own it, Conrad made an offer, but just before Hilton could close the deal, the owner raised the price. Frustrated, Conrad retreated to a nearby hotel called the Mobley. While standing in the lobby trying to figure out how to budge the cantankerous banker and get the price back down, Hilton noticed the hotel was filled to capacity. Investigating further, he discovered the hotel was renting out rooms by the hour in three shifts and was still turning them away. He decided then and there if he couldn't be a banker, why not a hotel man? Conrad approached the owner of the Mobley. The hotel owner wanted out. He wanted to strike it rich in the oil patch. Conrad purchased his very first hotel for $40,000. The Mobley wasn't much to look at, more of a flop house than a hotel. But the 40-room Mobley brought in over $2,000 a week. Others might be satisfied with such a profit, but not Hilton. He knew a gold mine when he saw it. Most of the Mobley's customers were roustabouts from the oil fields. Hilton figured all they wanted was a good meal, a stiff drink, and a cot. So he busted up the lobby to add rooms, built a bar, and put in a restaurant that served a hearty meal at a reasonable price. Customers got a bargain, and Conrad made a profit. And the Mobley was a smashing success, so much that Hilton forgot banking altogether. Soon, enough money came in from the Mobley that Hilton bought hotels in small Texas towns. His shrewd sense of bargaining learned behind the counter of his father's general store served him well. He was able to buy hotels at rock-bottom prices. They were fixer-upper hotels that were dilapidated and losing money. But they each had potential. Conrad developed an important business theme, dig for gold, or squeeze dollars from every space available. He cut lobby space in half and added more rooms or larger bars. He turned closets into gift shops, sold counter space to advertisers. Conrad's strategy worked and profits soared. With his business growing, Hilton needed a slogan, something snappy that would tell people what his hotel stood for. For weeks, Hilton thought, unable to come up with a way to sum up his business philosophy. Then, suddenly, it came to him. Minimax. He liked the sound of it, but what did it mean? In a moment, he knew. Minimum price for maximum service. Exactly what his hotel stood for. Hilton had found his slogan. By 1925, Conrad's small town chain included eight hotels. He was earning $100,000 a year. But something was missing from Conrad's life. Business was his number one priority. He had little interest in enriching his personal life. He was a private man. Uh, I, I think he had friends for different purposes. You'd have a, a, a friend to play golf with, a friend to ride horses with, a friend to do various things with, play cards with, that sort of thing. So he did have a lot of close friends. But uh, again, I, I think he was somewhat, uh, to a large extent, a private man. Conrad was also pious. Honoring the promise made to his mother, he attended Mass every Sunday. It was at church that Hilton met Mary Barron. Mary was visiting from Kentucky. Hilton was captivated by Mary's long chestnut hair, radiant smile, and sparkling blue eyes. Theirs was a passionate whirlwind courtship. On October 19, 1925, they were married and moved into a modest but comfortable house in El Paso, Texas. They seemed the perfect couple. Mary enjoyed keeping house and cooking her husband's favorite dish, tuna noodle casserole. She always found time to press her husband's business suits. Like Hilton, Mary had come from a large family, so she was as eager as her husband to start one of their own. The Hilton family grew to include three sons. But Conrad had a vision for what he wanted his business to become, and working towards his dream left little time for a home life. I would say that my father uh, was so dedicated to business that uh, 
he didn't have a lot of time to spend uh, with his uh, sons. Uh, he was preoccupied most of the time in, a, in achieving the success that he enjoyed. Uh, but I had such a profound respect for uh, his ability to uh, accomplish great things, and I, I really idolized him. As his family grew, so did Hilton's hotel business. By the end of the 20s, Hilton had built his first hotel in Albuquerque. Another in Dallas was under construction. Hilton had become well known throughout Texas, both for his business skills and unbridled enthusiasm. He seemed well on his way to making his first million. Then disaster struck, and his dream quickly turned into a nightmare. The Hilton Foundation put up $1.2 million to restore Conrad Hilton's flagship hotel, the Mobley. It now serves as the Cisco Chamber of Commerce in Texas. At age 40, Conrad Hilton was a man on the rise. He had gained the respect of his peers. He was becoming a wealthy man. He was the proud father of three. It appeared nothing could go wrong. Then came October 1929. The depression took a devastating toll on America. Thousands of businesses failed. Families were out on the street. Wealthier men than Conrad were forced to wonder where they'd get their next meal. Hilton appeared to be heading for ruin. As America's economy dried up, traveling salesmen stayed home instead of checking into a local Hilton hotel. Almost overnight, Conrad's businesses came to a halt. And it couldn't have happened at a worse time. Hilton was just finishing his most ambitious project, a high-rise hotel in downtown Dallas. When the depression hit, Hilton was deeply in debt. In less than a year, Conrad lost everything but one hotel, the El Paso Hilton. Almost overnight, his growing empire was wiped out and he was virtually ruined. Many successful businessmen of the era simply gave up, but not Hilton. He dug his heels in, tightened his belt, and went to work. He never worked harder. To cut heating bills, he ordered floors sealed off, rooms boarded up, he even cut back on the ink in the inkwells. At one time, he was $500,000 in debt without a penny to his name. But Conrad figured if he could keep the El Paso Hilton, he just might be able to survive. So when the lease payment came due on the El Paso, Hilton flew to Missouri, where a banker had promised to loan him the $40,000 needed to keep the hotel. But the banker reneged on the deal. Hilton turned desperate. If he lost the El Paso Hotel, he was finished. Once again, Conrad's ability to negotiate served him well. Back in Texas, he quickly arranged a meeting with his mother and a group of hotel suppliers. He promised that if each contributed $5,000 to help pay the lease, he'd buy from them for as long as he was in business. There was furious debate until finally one supplier spoke up. He said, well, here's my $5,000, Connie. And the others chipped in, and his mother chipped in $5,000, and he got the $40,000, and he said he grabbed it up, raced to the elevator, and down to the bank, and paid the lease payment. But he said had he not made that payment, he would have lost his empire then. Conrad saved the El Paso, but his financial troubles were far from over. Still massively in debt, Hilton persevered, determined to keep his reputation. Other hotels failed, but Hilton stayed afloat, Barely. They all went through bankruptcy. He did not go through bankruptcy. His attorneys argued with him and pleaded with him to go through bankruptcy, and he would pound his fist on his desk and say, I will not go through bankruptcy. And he never did. As the nation recovered from the paralyzing effects of the Depression, Hilton's business revived and grew stronger. As a result, Hilton emerged from the hardship with something more valuable than property a rock-solid reputation. But Hilton's hard work and efforts had a price, taking a toll on his family life and marriage. He would come home exhausted, if he came home at all. Mary had enough. Feeling neglected and abandoned, 
she filed for divorce in 1931. For a devout Catholic like Hilton, it was a tragic blow. Mary was gone, but in the eyes of his church, Conrad was still married. The Depression may have taken the woman he loved and wiped out his fortune, but it didn't destroy his business completely. Hilton's ability to survive the Depression actually helped his hotel empire grow. They all wanted to sell to Conrad Hilton because he was the one that didn't go through bankruptcy. And that's how he was able to acquire uh, many of the hotels that he was able to acquire. By the end of the 30s, Hilton was ready to begin buying new properties. He sensed the first waves of economic recovery would be strongest on the West Coast. In 1940, Conrad left El Paso for a sunnier climate, both financially and socially. He was embarking on a trip that would change his life. On the West Coast, a small-time hotel man could get eaten alive. But Conrad was shrewd. He saw opportunity where others saw disaster. As he had so often, he used events to his advantage. The war in the Pacific created panic on the West Coast. While others ran in fear of a Japanese invasion, Hilton decided to attack. Conrad Hilton was able to use certain events to the benefit of his business. And he realized with the prospect of possibly even a Japanese invasion, as many people thought there might be an invasion on the West Coast, property value was decreasing. And in fact, he was able to negotiate the purchase of a luxurious property in Los Angeles called the Townhouse. And you could almost say that he got it at bargain basement prices. Hilton's newest acquisition offered the chance for a new social life. Conrad Hilton was about to enter the world of Hollywood celebrity. He was determined to loosen up a bit, have some fun with his hard-won success, and what better place than sunny California. He enjoyed hobbies with his sons at his comfortable Beverly Hills home. Boating and fishing were just a short drive away at his mountain retreat. With his business firmly on track, Conrad was ready to enjoy life. Every night, he went dancing. At one of these nightclub outings, Hilton met an ambitious young woman trying to strike it rich in Hollywood. She was the 22-year-old former Miss Hungary, the young starlet's name, Zsa Zsa Gabor. To Zsa Zsa, Hilton was everything an American man should be. Tall, passionate, and rich. During their first dance, as the hotel man held her tight, she whispered in his ear, as only Zsa Zsa could, I think I will make you marry me. Bewitched by the Hungarian beauty, Hilton immediately fell under her spell. A few months later, he proposed. His business associates thought he was crazy. She was a gold digger, they whispered, a vixen who had eyes only for Hilton's millions. Hilton ignored them. His passion for Zsa Zsa was so strong that he even ignored the tenets of his faith. In the eyes of the Catholic Church, he was still married to his first wife, Mary. Against his friend's advice and church doctrine, Hilton and Zsa Zsa were married in 1941. With Zsa Zsa on his arm, Hilton was ready for his next and greatest challenge, the big leagues of the hotel business, New York. When he hit the Big Apple, the talk on Wall Street was that Hilton was a sucker. A rube from the sticks who didn't have the sense to know hotels were the worst of investments. But Hilton believed a post-war boom was coming that would blow the hotel industry sky high. With his usual sense for timing and faith in himself, he bought the Roosevelt Hotel. But when he took aim on the plaza, one of the city's most venerated institutions, New Yorkers were horrified. High society didn't like the thought of a Texas tumbleweed blowing into town and running New York's finest hotel. But Hilton was shrewd. He knew tradition was a part of what he was buying. New Yorkers let out a collective sigh of relief when Hilton announced the plaza would stay as is. He followed his New York purchases by buying the largest hotel in the world, Chicago's 3,000-room Stevens. He renamed it the Conrad Hilton. 
Conrad would soon enjoy success beyond even his original dreams. Success marked by tragedy and loss that all the money in the world could not change. When we return, the Hilton has an unexpected guest. When Castro came down out of the hills, he moved into our hotel. 